Krishna, good morning. Let's begin by offering our respects to the founder Acharya of ISKCON, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶತಾರಿಣೆ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣ ಸಿಂಧು ದೀನ ಬಂಧು ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾಕಾಂತ ರಾಧಾಕಾಂತ ನಮೋಸ್ತುತೆ ತಪ್ತ ಕಂಚನ ಜಾವರಂಗಿ ರಾಧೆ ವೃಂದಾವನೇಶ್ವರಿ ವೃಷಭಾನು ಸುತೆ ದೇವಿ ಪ್ರಣಮಾಮಿ ಹರಿಪ್ರಿಯೆ ವಾಂಶಕಲ್ಪತರುವ್ಯಶ್ಚ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧು ವ್ಯವಚ ಪತಿತಾಂ ಪಾವನೆಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾರ್ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಾದಿ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ರಿಪೀಟ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಮೀ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ವಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಟು ಅವರ್ ವೀಕ್ಲಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾ ಕ್ಲಾಸಸ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿತ್ ಅಸ್ ಆಂಟಿ ನೀತಾ ಆಜಾ ಆಯುಷ್ then we have bhavika who's joining us for the first time along with shivai we have divina dipti disha melwani uh, durga prasad prabhu then we have deepa harman hema karuna jadwani we have khushbu lal and mahak melwani manju we have n c venkatchari we have neha my parents are there ranjit das shri hari radha suhane gurung who's also joining us for the first time and we have vivansh okay so what did we see in the previous class the four types of people who surrender to lord krishna and four types who don't surrender okay so this was not in the previous class this was before that okay because this is what you're mentioning is in chapter 7 we are now on chapter 8 so what yes. is in the previous class the last 
with class. Which chapter are we on? Eight. Chapter 8. What is the title of chapter 8? This is uh, Attaining the Supreme. Yes, Attaining the Supreme. Very nice. So what did we see? The chapter begins with what? Chapter begins with? Arjuna saying with saying seven questions to Krishna. Yes, Arjuna is asking seven. seven questions. Yes. So where did he get these terms that he's asking? Is because Krishna mentioned these terms, these technical terms at the end of chapter number seven. So now Arjuna is asking the meanings of those terms that Krishna mentioned in the end of chapter seven. So this is how chapter eight begins. And which is the, of all those questions that Arjuna asks, which is the most important question, which forms the basis of practically the whole chapter? Does chapter anybody eight. remember? Is it chapter 8? Yeah, it forms the basis of the entire chapter 8. But what is that question which Krishna is practically answering for the rest of the chapter? For most of the chapter. The one most important of those seven questions. Okay, see here. Here we have a summary. So these are... Uh, Arjuna's questions. What is Brahma? So we have to remember that we should not confuse this with Lord Brahma or Brahmanas. Yeah, this is another word which means uh, basically in most of the Bhagavad Gita, it means spiritual. Okay. So here is asking what is Brahma? What is Adhyatma? What is Karma? What is Adi Bhuta? What is Adi Daiva? What is Adi Yagya? Or who is Adi Yagya? How is Adi Yagya known in the body? And how to know you at the point of death? So this is the most important crucial question here, which forms the main subject matter of the rest of the chapter. So Krishna very quickly in verses 3 and 4, he answers these questions, right? Arjuna's questions are in the first two verses. And 3 and 4, Krishna is answering six out of the seven questions. Very quickly, he answers them, which we have seen in detail in the previous class. And now Krishna is going to start answering this seventh question. See, in some uh, Gita guides, you may say, uh, you may fight that Arjuna asked eight questions. And in some Gita guides, you will say that Arjuna asked seven questions because, I mean, both are correct. Because if you, you can split this, uh, who is Adi Yagya and how is Adi Yagya known in the body? So some guides, they have split it into two and some have clubbed it as one question because that's how it appears in the translation. Okay, so... Uh, don't get confused by that. Both are correct. Some people say seven. Some people say eight questions. Okay. So we'll start today's session. Does anybody have a question from the previous class? Who can read today? I can read my page. Okay. Thank you, Arman. Shlok five. Yes. We start from shlok number five. So this is subtitle, Remembering Krishna at the Time of Death. Anta kale jama meva smaran mukva kale varam yahrayati samadhavam Translation And whoever at the end of his life quits his body, remembering me alone at once attains my nature. Of this there is no doubt. So Krishna is saying something very, very crucial here. How we can attain Krishna. So how can we attain Krishna is by remembering him alone at the time of death. So Krishna is saying, whoever at the end of this life 
quits his body remembering me alone attains my nature so we can attain a spiritual body we can become satchitananda we can attain that nature of satchitananda by remembering krishna at the time of death so this is what uh, we call the uh, the law of last thought what are your thoughts at the time of death um uh, determines what is your future destination if you are thinking about krishna at the time of death then you can attain krishna and then krishna is assuring right of this there is no doubt so he is saying that of this there is no doubt if you can remember krishna at the time of death then you can attain krishna you can attain the spiritual world you can be satchitananda no more birth death disease and old age and ashila prabhupada explains in the purport that that remembrance now one may think okay very easy when death occurs i will think of the lord at the time of death so what's the big deal meanwhile let me enjoy life no when death occurs i will think of krishna it's not so easy it doesn't happen like that because whatever thoughts we have accumulated throughout our lifetime that comes to our mind at the time of death because death is uh, very very painful actually our shastras explain that uh, the pain that one experiences at the time of death is like 42000 scorpions stinging you because the soul is pulled out of the body by for a sinful person by the yamadutas it's like somebody comes to your house and kicks you out of the house you've been living in that house for so many years you no know? one may have lived in this body the soul is in the body let's say somebody has lived in the body for 80 90 100 years um and then you are kicked out of that home where you have lived so it's not easy for the soul so the soul doesn't want to leave the body nobody likes to die but then the yamadutas they uh they pull the soul out of the body so it's very painful it's a very very painful condition so in that painful condition to think about krishna is going to be possible only if we have practiced it throughout our lifetime if a student has an exam and the student studies one day before the exam what are the chances of that student doing well in the exam compared to a student who has been studying for that exam for the past few weeks or one who has studied for that final exam throughout the year right which of the two students is going to remember and going to give the exam nicely obviously it's the student who has been studying throughout the year isn't it one one doing last minute studies there are no chances that he will uh, get uh, very good marks in flying colors so therefore we have to practice it throughout our lifetime so that it comes to our mind now that we have to remember krishna at the time of death so how is it possible to remember it is not possible that smaranam that remembrance is not possible for an impure soul how so okay how to purify how can we purify ourselves by practicing remembrance if we practice so when we chant japa every day we are chanting no taking the holy name so that that is a practice that is our sadhana so then by practicing that then that that enters our consciousness and then we can think of the lord at the time of death if we do not practice we cannot remember krishna at the end of this life so how to practice remembrance how to be effective at the time of death see one uh, we have this organization of the art of living of course very nice they are doing very good job but krishna here in the bhagavad gita is teaching us the art of dying how can we die successfully not live successfully but how can we die successfully because the whole success of our human life is is tested that time at the time of death are we able to remember krishna or are we thinking about family we are thinking about the wealth we have in the bank and so many other things no may come to our mind so for that we have to live in the mode of goodness uh, we have to eat satvik think satvik associate with satvik people like that we live in the mode of goodness if we are going to eat foods that are in the mode of passion and ignorance meat uh, onion and garlic uh, or uh, eating animals all that is not satvik satvik food is that which we can offer to the lord so when we eat wholesome food uh, pure foods then it also affects our consciousness life dedicated in the service to krishna and thus always thinking of krishna so dedicating our life in the service to krishna now that doesn't mean we don't have to go for a job we cannot have family but when even when we are working at that job and even when we are taking care of the family we can krishna eyes uh, spiritualize that activity when we take care of our children our, our husbands of our wives then we we see them uh, we we help each other 
to become krishna conscious we raise our children in krishna consciousness when we go for a job we are working so that we can maintain our krishna conscious family so that they are comfortable so that they can practice krishna consciousness smoothly so life dedicated in the service to krishna and thus always thinking of krishna constant and incessant chanting of the holy name best process Srila Prabhupada mentions the full Hare Krishna mantra three times in text 8.5 and 8.6 to stress the importance of this process. So really, uh, this is so important. These two uh, sh uh, shlokas, 8.5 and 8.6. Here Srila Prabhupada is mentioning the whole Hare Krishna mantra thrice in these two verses. In 8.5, he mentions twice. So uh, across all the purports of so many uh, books that Srila Prabhupada has translated, I think these must be the only two consecutive verses. As far as my knowledge goes, where Srila Prabhupada has mentioned the whole uh, Maha Mantra, I mean the whole mantra and that two, three times. So it must be that much more important. Mm -hmm. And we have to tolerate all impediments like a tree. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Shikshastakam verse number three. We will see that verse. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, as we know, is Krishna himself who appeared uh, 500 years ago in Sri Mayapur Dham. Uh, he is Krishna in the mood of Srimati Radharani or he is the combined form of uh, Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. So he, the only thing that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wrote is the Shikshastakam. There are eight verses of teaching. Shiksha means teaching, knowledge. And Ashtak, the word Ashtak means eight. So these are the eight verses. These are the only things that we have available. Uh, or rather, the only eight things that Shri, Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wrote. So in that verse, in the third verse, third Shikshastakam verse, uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Trinadapi suni chena, tarar api sahishnuna, amanena manadena, kirtaniya sadahari. One should chant the holy name of the Lord in a humble state of mind, thinking oneself lower than the straw in the street. So humility, humility is a very, very important quality to have in spiritual life. Even materially, humility can take you places. But if you have a puffed up ego, then we will have relationship issues. We will not get along with so many people. People will not like you. So even materially, um, humility goes a long way. So what to speak of in spiritual life? One should be more tolerant than a tree. So a tree is something that you can cut it, you can hurt it. People carve names on the trees, but the tree never stops giving us fruits, flowers, giving us shade. So one must be more tolerant than a tree. Devoid of all sense of false prestige. So one must not be expecting that, oh, I have my prestige. I want people should respect me. People should talk, me, talk to me in a certain way. They should behave with me. No, you have to be devoid of all sense of false prestige. And should be ready to offer all respect to others. So one should not expect other people to respect us. But we should be offering respect to everybody else. Because a devotee sees that the Paramatma is situated in the heart of every living entity. And so in such a state of mind, one can chant the holy name of the Lord constantly. So to remember the Lord, we have to chant his name. And in order to chant his name, what is it that we require is what uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is telling us here. We have to be lower than the thinking oneself to be low, the straw in the street, more tolerant than the tree, devoid of all sense prestige and ready to offer all respect to others. If we have these qualities, then we can chant the holy name of the Lord without any problems. See, this is a very nice verse because uh, we are talking about, uh, because how here Srila Prabhupada says that smaranam is not possible for an impure soul. Now, how does that purity, how will that purity come? There is another verse with regard to this. So, ahara shuddhav, sattva shuddhi. If your ahara, if your food is pure, shuddhav, then your mind will be pure. From the purity of food comes purity of the mind. Therefore, we should eat uh, Krishna Prasad. Krishna Prasad, so what we offer to Krishna is only sattvic food. We cannot offer meat. We cannot offer animals. We cannot offer onion and garlic to the Lord. So if your food is uh, wholesome, it's pure and wholesome, then your mind also will be pure. Your mind will be not agitated. Then Sattva Shuddha Dhruva Smriti. From the Purity of the mind comes remembrance of the Lord. So Smriti, that remember, and Dhruva means constant, right? Uh, strong and constant remembrance. That will come when your mind is pure. 
and then from constant remembrance of the lord one can become free from all bondage smriti lambe sarva granthinam so you can be free from all bondage and then vipra moksha you can get liberation so it all uh, begins with ahara shuddha your food should be pure if your food is pure and wholesome from that will come purity of the mind from purity of the mind comes constant remembrance of the lord and because one is constantly remembering the lord then you can be free from all material bondages and one can be liberated now remembrance can be uh, done in many ways so here in this um, verse we can see how different personalities remembered the lord differently so narada muni is speaking this verse to king yudhishthir so narada muni is saying my dear king yudhishthir the gopis by their lusty desires kamsa by his fear shishupala and other kings by envy the yadu yadus by their familial relationship with krishna you pandavas by your great affection for krishna and we the general devotees by our devotional service have obtained the mercy of krishna so one can think about krishna in so many different ways and obtain the mercy of krishna so did uh, the gopis attain the mercy of krishna no yes how how did they attain the mercy of krishna the gopis yes the gopis attain the mercy of krishna by uh, by feeding them their milk by in giving them the butter and by um, uh, doing service to them uh, when he was little they were the one who used to raise him and take care of him and look after him as well as yashoda used to do the same thing but they yashoda was busy in doing her house chores so they used to talk to him they used to play with him they used to give him opportunities to steal the butter from their home and have wishes and they used to look for him and think about him 24 hours and at the time of when he was gone they became gopi chandan they couldn't bear the separation and so they became chandan they died actually they they just they left their body okay so why does the word why the word lusty are the gopis lusty no. no there is not even 1% lust in them if there were then it would be a different scenario but because lust cannot be because he is transcendental so lust cannot come within them. and they are also transcendental because they are in in his leela they are all demigods and so the lust cannot enter her body and also krishna whoever whoever um, likes him in whatever department like lust or anger or whatever department it's it's actually not lust you know it's it's shown to be lust by the materialized you will vision it as it's lust but it's actually not lust it's pure love because even a pinch of lust cannot bear in their body it cannot stay there's no yes. such thing as lust in their body exactly so as you said it's it's lust only from the material or external angle of vision you no know, from for an outsider for an ordinary onlooker it appears to be lust but actually the gopis are the purest uh, devotees of krishna and their desire if you can say if quote unquote the lust their lust is only that they want to satisfy the desires or the senses of the lord okay so externally it looks like the gopis are having a mundane love affair with krishna but it is transcendental that's why uh, such subject matters we should always hear from a superior authority from from the spiritual master or from a, from an advanced devotee you know, in order to understand sub, such subject matters otherwise uh, we will misunderstand okay now let's come to Kamsa. Kamsa was always uh, fearful of Krishna. No, ever since, even before Krishna appeared, Kamsa was told that Devaki's eight son will kill you. So he was constantly thinking about Krishna. So that smriti, that remembrance, is constantly there, but not in a favorable way. So yes, Kamsa also was always remembering Krishna. Smriti was there, but it was not favorable. Shishupal also was always remembering Krishna, but out of envy. Shishupal was very very envious of Krishna. Therefore, he came during the Rath Soya sacrifice. and uh, he he protested that krishna should be 
uh, given honor and respect in the Raj Soya sacrifice. No? So these are different ways by which one can remember Krishna. But then, of course, Srila Prabhupada uh, mentions in the purport that how uh, one should think about Krishna in a favorable way, not in an unfavorable way. The best way to remember Krishna is what is described by Sri Rupa Goswami in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu or Nectar of Devotion. So he explains, Anya Abhilashita Shunyam, Jnana Karmadi Anavritam, Anukulyena Krishnanu, Shilanam Bhaktir Uttama. So what is Uttama Bhakti? The topmost Bhakti is, one should render transcendental loving service to the Supreme Lord Krishna favorably, hmm, favorably, and without desire for material profit or gain through fruitive activities or philosophical speculation. That is called pure devotional service. So that is Uttama Bhakti. When we render transcendental loving service favorably without desiring anything else. Anya Abhilashita, all other Abhilasha is Shunyam, zero. So this is uh, topmost Bhakti. Let's see what Krishna says next. Yam yam vabismaran bhavam Yajatyante kalevaram Tam tam evaiti kaunteya Sadatad bhava bhavitaha Translation Whatever state of being one remembers when he quits his body O son of Kunti That state he will attain without fail so whatever state you remember when you are quitting the body, whatever is your last thought at the time of death, that is the state that you will attain. That is the kind of body that you are going to attain. Now, let's say somebody is driving and he's listening to Bollywood songs in the car and suddenly there is a crash, an accident, and the person dies in that car crash on the spot. What do you think is going to happen to that person? He's going to be a Bollywood singer. A Bollywood singer. Okay. So that's good or bad to become a famous Bollywood singer, earn a lot of money, be famous. Is good or bad? Bad. Why bad? Because it attains because... another body. You come to another body. Because of that uh, mind association with the uh, objective, with material objective, creates another body for you because it, it creates an enjoyment sensation in your mind that oh I, when I have money, when I become a singer, when I'm famous, everybody will love me and it's puffed up, you know it's not humble and meekness and it also creates another body and it's a sensation of enjoyment Okay, very nice so this is from the spiritual angle of vision which is of course correct but you know, even if uh, one has to I mean as Vivan said, if one becomes a, a singer, a Bollywood singer, for that he should also have that much material karma, uh, that much of punya karma to back it. If he doesn't have that kind of punya karmas where he can become rich and famous in the next lifetime, then he will end up becoming a cleaner of that room of the Bollywood singer. So he's in the right place. He's in the studio. He's cleaning. He's in the right place, but not in the uh, right position. So for that also, he must have the karma to back it, to become a rich Bollywood star or a Bollywood singer. Okay. See, this, this uh, statement of Krishna also refutes the statement that we usually hear from many people that uh, Sapko, uh, everybody has the same destination. Everybody has to anyway die. Everybody has to go to the same place. Everybody has the same destination. So what? Uh, eat, drink and be merry. No, Enjoy life. Uh, just enjoy life and don't worry about anything else. Anyway, everybody has to die and go to the same destination. No, it's not the same. The destination for a non-devotee and destination for a devotee is not the same. Krishna is saying, whatever state of being one remembers when you quit the body, that state you will attain. So if you are thinking about Krishna, you will go to Krishna. If you are thinking about something else, then you will go to something else. Suppose you are very much, very much attached to your properties. You are very much attached to your house. Then what will happen in the next lifetime? you will end up being becoming a dog or some kind of a living entity around that place no this if you like if if see it you'll find uh snakes uh 
if there is gold and wealth buried under the ground, you will normally find snakes there. It's because the that, sna that soul in the snake's body was previously uh, attached to that, that particular gold that is dug there. And now he has acquired a snake body and he's around that wealth. So the destination is not the same for a devotee and a, and a non devotee. Krishna is saying that what you remember at the time of death, that state you will attain without fail. <coughs> hmm? So that's the reason why if you, if we know that somebody is in, in his last few days, he is going to pass away, as devotees, one must try his best to help him remember the Lord by playing the Maha Mantra very close to his ears and uh, or by doing some loud kirtan or by reading the Srimad Bhagavatam, reading the Bhagavad Gita uh, loud enough so that he can hear you, that will uh, help the person uh, remember the Lord. You know, one person may be in coma, but he can always hear. The hearing is the last sense that fails uh, at the time of death. He can The person on the deathbed cannot see, he cannot speak, but he can definitely hear you. He may be in deep coma still, he can hear you. So uh, this is how we can help a person who is on the last few days of his life. But what happens now materially, uh, I have seen uh, somebody is passing away, the friends would come. Now, he led a materialistic life. So he has this group of friends who come there and they say, oh, what are you doing? Come on, you have to get well soon. We have to go and have our, um, you have to come and join us for our next party. Uh, let's drink whiskey and wine together. That's how they talk to that person who's dying. To, they think that they are pepping him up so that he gets well soon and he can get back to his enjoyment days. Or sometimes the person is losing his memory. So they ask him, do you remember me? Do you know what is my name? It's not important if that person has lost his memory and he doesn't remember your name. You can make him remember the name of the Lord. So usually this is what happens. But as devotees, uh, what we can do is make that person remember the Lord. Not that he should remember your name or that he should remember the old good times we had when we had wine and whiskey in the in the pubs. That's that's not how we talk to a person who's going to pass away within the next few days. See, one example, uh, one person who taught us by his own example how we should give up the body is Bhishma Dev. When Bhishma Dev was on his... Um, on the bed of arrows and he just before he gave up his body he requested krishna if he could stand by his feet so that bhishma dev can give up his body looking at the lotus face of lord shri krishna so bhishma dev by his own personal example taught us how we should give up our body looking at krishna thinking about krishna so that that is our last thought on our mind so bhishma dev practically applied krishna's teaching on the art of dying There is one story of Lalaji. Lalaji is a businessman. He has his shop and every day he, he runs the shop. It's a nice flourishing business. He has a nice family, children, wife to take care of him. Everything is very smooth. But suddenly when he is going back to his house, he slips and he falls. He gets hurt on his head and he enters into coma. After a few weeks, he comes out of his coma. He sees his family members around him. He opens his eyes, he sees all his family members around him. And what do you think he is the first thing he's going to say? A gross materialist. The first How is my shop? Ah, is my yes. He is thinking, he is saying, all of you are here, so dukan pe kon beta? Who's there in the shop? No? So, so that's what is going on in the mind of a gross materialist. But if he's a devotee, then he's going to think differently. So what we do, what we think throughout our lifetime influences our thoughts at the time of death. Who is this personality? Jar Bharat. Yes, this is Bharat Maharaj. Jara Bharata was his next lifetime. In this lifetime, in the picture, uh, he was Bharat Maharaj. It is after him that our country is yes. called uh, Bharat Varsha. Hmm? Bharat Varsha is called after him, King Bharat. He was a great king. He was a king of the entire globe. And the Srimad Bhagavatam describes how he ruled or he enjoyed material prosperity for 10 million years, for 10 million years. Then he decided that, okay, it's time to retire. It's time to uh, focus on spirituality. So he, he leaves the kingdom and he goes to the forest and he starts to do austerities. But it so happened that once when he was in the forest by the river, he saw a female deer, a doe, was pregnant and uh, she suddenly jumped 
across the river. She tried to jump because she heard the loud roaring of a lion. By the loud roaring of the lion, that deer was so um, uh, afraid, so scared that she tried to jump across the river. But it so happened that out of that fright, she died. But before she died, uh, this uh, baby deer uh, came out. She delivered the deer before um, she died. So Maharaj Bharat saw this and then he said, okay, I want to... Uh, he had some compassion for this newborn deer and he took her under his shelter and he started to take care of the deer. So is this wrong or right? It's wrong because it was not his responsibility to take care of the deer. So he should have just let the deer die? He doesn't... Mm -hmm. well, but what does it should have... Mean? What does he it should mean have not got attached to it. What does that mean? No, no. What him showing compassion to the, to the deer is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But as Harman said, that he should have not got attached to it because what happened was he became very attached to the deer. He became I'm so attached that. to the deer that okay. the deer was always on his thoughts and it was interfering with his own sadhana, with his own spirituality as he was doing his spirituality, his own sadhana. He was getting distracted by the thoughts of the deer. That was what was his error. Not that he took the deer under shelter, took care of the deer. That's okay. The showing compassion is, is the nature of a Vaishnava. But you should not allow the love for anything else, supersede the love for the Lord. And that was his mistake. So he was so uh, engrossed in the thoughts of the deer, in, the, in protecting the deer, that eventually when death appeared, when death happened, his last thought was the deer. And therefore, in the next lifetime, he got the body of a deer. deer. Yeah, he was born as a deer. Now, this great Bharat Maharaj, imagine now he has the body of a deer. But because he had done some austerity, he had done some devotional service, he had done spirituality, he was not an ordinary deer. In that deer body, he was able to remember his past lifetime. Uh, and he was able to remember how he got distracted and how he thought of the deer and therefore now he has the body of the deer. So in the deer body, he would spend his, uh, uh, with austerity again, he spent that, uh, his deer body uh, conscious of Krishna, in Krishna consciousness. And then again, he took another birth which was Jada Bharata. Now, as Jada Bharata, uh, he, he now Jada Bharata remembered his past two lifetimes. Again, because of the austerity that he had done previously, he remembered his past two lifetimes. So now as Jada Bharata, he said that, okay, in this human body, I don't want to get entangled. I don't want to get attached. So therefore, he behaved like a madman. Whatever he was taught by his father, he would not learn. No, he would act as though he's crazy, he's mad, he's foolish. And many a times his uh, stepbrothers would uh, mi mistreat him, ill-treat him. And once he was even taken by some dacoits to be slaughtered in a Kali Mata temple. But then Goddess Kali appeared from the deity and she slaughtered all these dacoits who wanted to slaughter uh, Jada Bharata, no? Because actually he was very learned, but he was behaving like a madman. He was behaving as though he is foolish. But then again, at the end of the lifetime of Jada Bharata, eventually then he went back home, back to Godhead. So the point is, because Bharat Maharaj was thinking of the deer at the time of death, he got the body of a deer. But because he had done some devotional service in the previous lifetime, he, he was given the... Uh, facility to remember his past lifetime and learn from his mistake. And also we have seen the story of Ajamila, you know, how Ajamila at the time of death, he called out uh, Narayan and therefore the Vishnu Dutas came. Although he was only calling out to his son, but because the name of his son is the name yes. of God, therefore the Vishnu Dutas came and they gave him a second chance. No, He lived for a little longer so that he has an ex some extra time to perfect his life before again then he went back home, back to God. So the, the last thought on your mind, the time of death is what determines your next body. Now, one may ask, what if one thinks of the spiritual master at the time of death? Because one may be very attached to one's guru. So, what if one thinks of the spiritual master at the time of death? So, here, this, this, this verse is from the Padma Purana. And Lord Shiva speaks to Goddess Parvati. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he quotes this in the 
Chaitanya Charita Amrita in this particular verse. So what does Lord Shiva say? Aradhanam Sarvesham. Of all the Aradhanas, of all the different kinds of worship, of all the varieties of worship, Sarvesham. Vishnur Aradhanam Param. The topmost Aradhana, the topmost worship is that of Lord Vishnu. Hmm. The worship of Lord Vishnu is the topmost. However, above the worship of Lord Vishnu, Tasmat Parataram Devi. However, above the worship of Lord Vishnu is what? Rendering of service to Vaishnavas who are related to uh, Lord Vishnu. Tadiyanam. Tadiyanam means all those people who are in relationship with the Lord, which means his devotees. And the spiritual master is also, of course, a devotee. And therefore, Archanam. Samarchanam means the Archanam of that person is the even above the worship of Lord Vishnu. Therefore, we worship the spiritual master as good as God. The spiritual master never says that he is God. If the guru says that he is God, then you know that he is bogus. Okay, But a, a bona fide spiritual master will never say that he is God. He will always say that he is the servant of God. But still, we worship the spiritual master as good as God. Yes. Okay, if I if I have to think of Krishna at the time of death, I will do so. For now, let me enjoy. This is what many people would say. But we have to remember that death will not come at with an advance notice. Okay, you have 30 days. 30 days from now, you're going to die. You're not going to have an advance notice. Death can strike at any time. Death can strike at any time. You may not have the time to prepare to have Krishna in your thoughts at the time of death. So one's thoughts during the course of one's life accumulate to influence one's thoughts at the moment of death. So this life creates one's next life. If in one's present life, one lives in the mode of goodness and always thinks of Krishna, it is possible for one to remember Krishna at the end of one's life. So all your thoughts at the time of death comes accumulating. It's like this uh, movie running. No, Your whole lifetime is in front of you. It's running, 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 running. And then one frame freezes and that is you know the way it's frozen then that's it so if you lived your lifetime of devotional service then wherever it freezes it doesn't matter because you have lived a life of devotion okay so all your thoughts during your life accumulate to influence your thought at the moment of death at the time of death severe unbearable pain makes takes away the consciousness of all living entities who have accepted material bodies Now, one may ask the question, okay, I will live a life of devotion, but for some reason, I am not able to remember the Lord at the time of death. Let's say death was so sudden, you no, know, suddenly I was hit by a big truck and I died on the spot, crash, in one moment, death, gone. I didn't have the time to think of Krishna. So then... Another the body. next slide. Say this verse. Very nice verse. Krishna says. If my devotee is unable to remember me at the time of death because of disturbances felt within the body at that time, then I shall remember my devotee and take him back to my supreme abode. So even if we cannot remember for whatever reason, if we have lived a life of devotion, then Krishna will remember us. We may forget Krishna will never forget. Every single service that we have done for the Lord, even the simplest of uh, service, even the reading in these classes, those, who are, those of you who read in the classes, the translations, even that is devotional service, right? So every single word that is spoken in these classes, that you read the translations or you answer questions, every single thing is made a note of by Krishna. So every, we may forget, but the Lord will never forget what service we do to the Lord. So Krishna says that even if my devotee is unable to remember me, I will remember my devotee and take him back to my supreme abode. Because Krishna is a, is a Lord of love. For formality's sake, when a man is lying on his deathbed, his relatives come to him and sometimes they cry very loudly, addressing the dying man. Oh, my father. Oh, my friend. 
Oh, my husband, in that pitiable condition, the dying man wants to speak with them and instruct them of his desires. But because he is fully under the control of the time factor death, he cannot express himself and that causes him inconceivable pain. He is already in a painful condition because of disease and his glands and throat are choked up with mucus. He is already in a very difficult position. And when he is addressed by his relatives in that way, his grief increases. His grief only increases. So, see, the at the time of death, the uh, our um, openings, our glands, throat is all choked up with mucus. And that's why a person, a dying man, he cannot speak because it's all choked up with mucus. So when when the, the relatives are talking to him like this, he only feels more miserable because he's not able to talk. He's not able to reply. He's not able to say what he wants to say. So how can we ease that thing is by helping him to remember the Lord at the time of death. Not tell him, no, do you remember my name? Or oh, let's do you remember the times we had? You have to get well soon. No, that's not how we talk to a person who's on his deathbed. So bhakti is not a retirement plan. Bhakti is not something that has to be done when one is old. We don't know if we will grow old in the first place. Death can strike. You may be one year old or you may be 150 years old. Death can strike at any time. There is no guarantee that we will be alive even in the next minute. We have seen so many such cases, no? And bhakti is not an extracurricular activity. Okay, I will enjoy, I will do all kinds of things and I'll do a little bit of bhakti also in the side. No, it's not an extracurricular activity. It is something, it is the most, it, Krishna consciousness is an emergency, Srila Prabhupada said. Bhakti is not a crash course that can be done at a, can be taken up at a mundane coaching center. We cannot uh, just say, okay, I will learn a little bit of bhakti. Oh, I, I found this guru and let me go and learn something. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just learn something in 10 minutes. You know, uh, nowadays people want crash courses. But bhakti is not a crash course that can be taken at a mundane coaching center. We need to find a bona fide, authorized authority from whom we have to learn in a humble and submissive attitude and uh, with a mood of seva, with service, then we can please the spiritual master. Then we can learn from him the absolute truth. Bhakti takes a lifetime of preparation. It's a whole lifetime of preparation. It's not something that we can start today and okay, okay, I'll do it for six months. No, it's a whole lifetime. The moment-to-moment -moment choices we make, every single moment is, is determining our future, is determining our destination. Bhakti is Jaiva Dharma. Bhakti is Nitya Dharma. Jaiva Dharma means it is the duty of every Jiva. It is the duty of every living entity. Because we are all parts and parcels of the Lord. Because we are eternally the servants of the Lord. Therefore, we have to serve. So, Bhakti is Jaiva Dharma. And Bhakti is Nitya Dharma. Nitya means always, eternally. Eternally, we are the servants. Eternally, we have to serve. So, devotional service, Bhakti is Nitya Dharma. See, unfortunately, now uh, we do not understand such things because in the Kali Yuga, there are many things that are declining. And uh, there are eight more prominent things that are mentioned by Sukadeva Goswami in the Srimad Bhagavatam. He says that in the Kali Yuga, religion, truthfulness, cleanliness, tolerance, mercy, duration of life, physical strength and memory will diminish day by day because of the powerful influence of the age of Kali. This is the reason because we are in Kali Yoga, we will see that religion is reducing. Truthfulness is reducing. People don't speak the truth. They very easy for them to speak lies. No, very easily they speak lies. Um actually, there is a there is a Shastrik verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam where Mother Earth is speaking, and she is saying that she can bear the weight of so many mountains and rivers and big, big trees. She can bear the weight of all these heavy, heavy things. But she cannot bear the weight of a person who speaks lies. Mother Earth is saying, talking like that. But nowadays, very easy for people to speak lies. So religion, truthfulness, cleanliness. People are not internally clean. Neither are they externally clean. They don't want to have a bath. They will apply perfumes and so many other things. But they don't want to have a bath. Tolerance. Nobody wants to tolerate. Everybody wants to be the boss. Mercy. 
people are no more merciful they want to mind their own business they don't want to get into other people's problems there is no mercy duration of life we know that our ancestors they lived for longer periods of time we know with every passing gener every generation is living lesser than the previous generation hmm? physical strength even physical strength each generation has lesser physical strength than the previous generation and even memory hmm? people do not remember we we may not even remember what we had for lunch our last meal what was our last meal what did we eat we have to think for some time no we don't immediately remember we have so many uh, devices no uh, gigabytes and uh, tvs and so many other uh, external uh, devices to for memories but we we tend to forget the password only we don't remember the password to access them so memory is also diminishing by the day because of the influence of the age of kali this is the reason why in Kali Yoga, Bhakti, uh, the process to attain God has been simplified greatly to a great extent. In the Satya Yoga, as we discussed, people had to meditate for 60,000 years, 60,000, 60,000 years. But in Kali Yoga, just by chanting the holy name, you can go back home, back to Godhead at the end of this lifetime. It doesn't require you to, uh, to chant the holy name for 60,000 years. Only 16 rounds minimum. It takes two hours in a day. Out of 24 hours, two hours, 16 rounds. Srila Prabhupada said you chant 16 rounds and follow the four regulatory principles. You can go back home, back to Godhead at the end of this lifetime. No more lifetimes. So because this age of Kali is so rotten, so fallen, therefore it has been simplified greatly. And we are very, very fortunate because for so many reasons, you see, first of all, we are fortunate that we have a human birth. Secondly, we are fortunate because we have a human birth in Kali Yoga where um, the process to go back home, back to Godhead is simplified greatly. We don't have to do so much tapasya and austerities. It's simplified greatly for us. Third, we are very fortunate because we are in the same cycle which in which Krishna appeared. Krishna appears once in a day of Brahma. That is once in 311 trillion and 40 billion years. So he comes once in 311 trillion and 40 billion years. But we are in that same cycle of Kali Yuga where Krishna appeared, which is in the previous Dwapara Yuga only Krishna was personally present on this planet. We are in that immediate Kali Yuga when Krishna appeared. No, So we are that much more fortunate. And we are also very fortunate because we are in the same cycle because every time Krishna appears, after him comes Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu walked this planet only 500 years ago. So we have not missed him by like so many millions, billions, trillions of years, you see. So we are very fortunate again that we are born in the same um, cycle no, same Divya Yuga, where Krishna appeared, where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared, and also when Srila Prabhupada appeared. Srila Prabhupada is not an ordinary personality. He is that personality who is predicted in the Shastras. Actually, the Shastras predicted that there will be this person who will come and he will spread the chanting of the holy name in every town and village. Okay, this There are many predictions in the Shastra about Srila Prabhupada. So we are in the same cycle. You know, Srila Prabhupada passed away in 1977. So we have not missed him uh, greatly and still we have the good fortune fortune of being in touch with the direct disciples of Srila Prabhupada. So we have everything going for us. Another thing, why another reason why we are fortunate is because we are in the golden period of Kali Yuga. After 5,000 years of Kali Yuga begins the golden period, which is which has a duration of 10,000 years. And during those 10,000 years, the, the chanting of this holy name will spread like anything, will spread a lot all throughout the world. So we are in the golden period of Kali Yuga. So we have everything going for us. And if we don't take to Bhakti, then there is no, no greater unfortunate person than us because we have everything going for us. Okay. Let's go to the next. Tasmat Sarveshu Kaleshu Mamanusmara Yudhyacha Mayar Pitamano Buddhir Mame Vaishyasya Samshaya Translation Therefore, Arjuna, you should always think of me in the form of Krishna and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty of fighting. With your activities dedicated to me and your mind and intelligence fixed on me, you will attain me without doubt.
you should always think of me in the form of krishna and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty of fighting now so arjuna should not misunderstand okay i have to think of krishna so therefore i don't have to fight the war no krishna is saying you think of me and at the same time you carry out your prescribed duty so of course the same lesson is for us also we have to think of krishna at the same time we have to do about go about doing our prescribed duties we have whatever is our duty material duties we have to take care of our prescribed duties we cannot say that oh i don't want to do this i don't want to do that i don't want to take care of my family i just want to go to the forest i want to leave everything i will join the temple or i will just sit in my room and listen to my classes and i don't want to do anything else no whatever are your material duties you have to do your material duties and at the same time you have to think of krishna both we have to do then krishna says with your activities dedicated to me and your mind and intelligence fixed on me you will attain me without doubt so when we when we um dedicate our activities to the lord then automatically our subtle body also gets fixed on to the lord because mind and intelligence are part of our subtle body so when our activities are dedicated to the lord automatically our subtle body also uh, uh automatically we are also offering our subtle body to the lord and then again krishna says you will attain me without a doubt so there is no question of uh, it not happening krishna is assuring that there is no doubt about it abhyas yoga yuktena chetasa nanya gamina paramam purusham divyam yati parthanu chintayan translation He who meditates on me as the supreme personality of Godhead, his mind constantly engaged in remembering me, undeviated, undeviated from the path. He, O Partha, is sure to reach me. See, this point is so important of remembering Krishna that he is um, he is uh, repeating the same point. What he said in eight point seven, he is repeating the same point in eight point eight. so again krishna is saying he who meditates on me as the supreme personality of god is his mind constantly engaged in remembering me so abhyasa yoga abhyasa yoga if you are practicing abhyasa abhyas means practice if you are practicing um, yoga and chetasa your 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 chit your mind is constantly engaged in remembering me so you are not getting deviated you are not getting distracted na anya gamina there is no other deviation your mind there your mind is not getting distracted by any other thing then you are sure to reach me krishna is saying then you can get to paramam purusham divyam paramam purusham divyam which is none other than krishna the supreme personality of god at the transcendental supreme personality of god so like that again krishna is repeating the same point that he said in the previous verse again he is giving the assurance that person is sure to reach me so krishna is promising he is assuring this to his devotees okay now uh, we come to the next section of the bhagavad gita where here now krishna is talking about yoga mishra bhakti we you may you may recall in in chapter 7 how we saw the different categories of devotees we saw karma mishra bhakti bhakti mixed with the desire to enjoy uh, material activities jnana mishra bhakti where bhakti is mixed with jnana with mixed with the desire to accumulate knowledge then we have yoga mishra bhakti where bhakti is mixed with aspiration for liberation from birth and death because a pure devotee shuddha bhakta is anya abhilashita shunam he does not even have the desire to get liberation from birth and death his only desire is i want to serve the lord so this section here is going to talk about yoga mishra bhakti or those who practice dhyana yoga and then they realize the brahman or the paramatma feature of the lord now pure bhakti does not depend on karma or jnana or yoga it simply consists of loving affairs results of activities transcendental knowledge and liberation are all automatic by products of loving service to the lord so it's not that one who does shuddha bhakti does not get what a yoga mishra bhakta or a jnana mishra bhakta or a karma mishra bhakta gets he gets that by default it's it's you're getting it anyway as a by product but a pure uh, devotee does not desire it his only desire is to serve the lord to only please the 
whatnot. So this section talks about yoga mishra bhaktas, those whose desire, whose bhakti is mixed with desire to get liberated from the cycle of birth and death. Those who do dhyana yoga. So in these verses in chapter 7, we saw these different kinds of devotees and we have already discussed this. So we will not discuss this again. See here, um, in the Shikshastakam, 8th Shikshastakam verse, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is explaining, I know no one but Krishna as my Lord and he shall remain so even if he handles me roughly by his embrace or makes me broken hearted by not being present before me. So this is, this is pure devotional service that to love Krishna, irrespective of whether Krishna hands you roughly or he's embracing you or he's breaking your heart. Because sometimes uh, when, when one is going through a, a rough time, uh, some bad times, some difficult times, one may think, oh, why is Krishna doing this to me? But then we have to understand that no matter what Krishna does to you, it's for your well-being, is for your benefit. Sometimes we have to go through some purificatory processes because when we go through anxiety, when we go through difficulties, then we are also being purified. Just as how gold, uh, it has to go through some uh, difficult process before it can be uh, be before it becomes the pure, glittering, beautiful gold, isn't it? So sometimes we have to go through some processes in order to purify our own selves. He is completely free to do anything and everything for he is always my worshipful Lord unconditionally. So this is pure bhakti. This is the eighth Shikshastakam verse. See, a pure devotee does not accept any kind of liberation. Salokya, Sashti, Samipya, Sarupya or Ekatva. Even though they are offered by the Supreme Personality of God. So a pure devotee does not want, he does not want any kind of liberation. Salokya means you get the, that kind of liberation where you are, you can live on the same loka, on the same planet as the Lord. So Salokya. Sashti, you get the same opulence as the Lord. Samipya, you can live as a close associate of the Lord. Sarupya, you, you get the same form, same rupa as the Lord. And Ekatva means you uh, merge into the Brahman effulgence. But a pure devotee does not accept any of these kinds of liberation. He does not even want liberation. So let's see. Verse 9. Kavim Puranam Anushasitaram Anoraniyam Samanusmaredya Sarvasya Dhataram Achintya Rupam Aditya Varnam Tamasah Parastam Translation One should meditate upon the Supreme Person as the one who knows everything, as he is who is the oldest, who is the controller, who is smaller than the smallest, who is the maintainer of everything, who is beyond all material conception, who is inconceivable, and who is always a person. He is luminous like the sun, and he is transcendental beyond this material nature. So here Krishna is uh, explaining what are the different ways by which we can remember the Lord, by which we should remember the Lord. So here we have a summary. We have to remember the Lord as Kavim, knower of everything, past, present and future. Puranam, the oldest. Why oldest? Because everyone is coming from him. Anusha Shistaram, he is the controller. Then he is smaller than the smallest. How he is smaller than the smallest? Because he enters into the atom. He enters into the heart of every living entity. And what is the size of the jiva? What is the size of the soul? The size of the living entity is one ten thousandth part of the tip of the hair. That is the size of the living entity. But he enters into the heart of every living entity. He is a maintainer of everyone. He is inconceivable. Achintya. Achintya means he is, it's inconceivable. You cannot understand the Lord. We cannot with our um, limited intelligence, we cannot, we cannot understand him. No? He is inconceivable. He is beyond all material conception. All big planets are floating by his energy. God's energy is beyond our thinking jurisdiction. Logic and philosophical speculation cannot touch him. So we cannot understand the Lord by our logic. We are, The mistake that we make or most people make is that we apply our logic to the Lord. We say that, okay, it's not possible for a seven-year-old boy to lift the Govardhan mountain. So it's only, um, it's only a story. It's not true. How can that be possible? So we cannot apply our logic to understand God because the Lord is inconceivable. 
sign of real intelligence accept the principles of shastra as it is avoid useless arguments and speculations so we have to always remember that what we read in the scriptures is true we may not be able to understand how it is true so that right we have we can ask a senior authority we can ask the spiritual master how is it true don't say that oh that's not true hmm? then we have to remember him as a person god is a person he is not just an energy or a light someone who's distant someone who's impersonal no god is a person like you and me but he is purushottama he is the topmost person then aditya varna he is luminous like the sun and he is transcendental beyond this material nature so krishna the lord does not have to follow the rules and regulations of this material world many people have a problem oh krishna is dancing with the gopi so i can also have many girlfriends no he is beyond this material nature but we are still in this material world we have to follow the rules and regulations of this material world then prayan kale manasa chalena bhaktya yukto yoga balena chaiva ध्ये प्राणमावेश्य सतम परम पुरुषम पैति दिव्यम ट्रांसलेशन वन हु एट द टाइम ऑफ डेथ फिक्सेस हिज लाइफ एयर बिटवीन द आईब्रोस एंड बाय द स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ योगा विद अनडिविएटिंग माइंड एंगेजेस हिमसेल्फ इन रिमेंबरिंग द सुप्रीम लॉर्ड इन फुल डिवोशन विल सर्टेनली अटेन टू द सुप्रीम पर्सनालिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड so all these practices will help the yogi to remember krishna will help him to uh, have that smaranam remember this section uh, krishna is talking about the dhyana yogis so therefore he is he is recommending that at the time of death fix the life air between the eyebrows and the and by the strength of yoga with an undeviating mind engage himself in remembering the supreme lord in full devotion therefore you can certainly attain to the supreme personality of god but in bhakti a bhakti yogi does not have to do this you don't have to fix the life air between the eyebrows this this is not for bhakti yoga this is only for the dhyana yogis but of course in kali yoga the recommended process is bhakti yoga so this is what um, krishna is talking about here raising the consciousness and then holding the uh, consciousness uh, in the middle of your eyebrows and then eventually the soul is likely to escape if if you are successful then the soul escapes from the top of the head like how uh, dhritarashtra with dhritarashtra after the war was over and he left the palace he went to the forest he was in meditation and then his body burst into flames you know the the soul leaves from the top of the body in the body was if so one is if one is successfully completed this process then this is what happens but in kali yoga um it is it is uh, it is not so probable that one can be successful in this process therefore in kali yoga the recommended process is bhakti yoga very interestingly you will see that how uh each of these chakras actually correspond to certain glands the glands that we have in our body not certain but all the glands in our body they correspond to the the chakras and they release certain hormones so everything is scientific okay let's see learn yadakcharam veda vido vadanti vishanti adyat yo vitaraga यदिच्छन्तो ब्रह्मचर्यं चरन्ति तत्ते पदं संग्रहेण प्रवक्ष्ये ट्रान्सलेशन पर्सन्स हु आर लर्नड इन द वेदास हु अटर ओमकार एंड हु आर ग्रेट सेजेस इन द रिनाउंड ऑर्डर एंटर इनटू ब्राह्मण डिसाइडिंग सच परफेक्शन वन प्रैक्टिसेस सेलिबसी I shall now briefly explain to you this process by which one may attain salvation. So here Krishna is talking about those who utter omkara. Okay? And one has to uh, practice celibacy. Of course, when one is in the forest and practicing this uh, Sat Chakra Yoga or Dhyana Yoga, there is no question of having uh, relationships with members of the opposite gender. And uh, Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport, because here krishna is talking about those who enter into the brahman effulgence the light that is coming from krishna's body so who enters into the brahman impersonal brahman 
Krishna says here, those who are, so there are four conditions for that. Krishna says, those who are learned in the Vedas, those who utter Omkara, those who practice celibacy, and great sages in the renounced order of life. Now, what is the Vedic system? Students learn to vibrate Om and learn of impersonal Brahman by living in complete celibacy in the Gurukul of their spiritual master. So previously, the children would go to the Gurukul and they would live there with the Guru. It was like a boarding school. But in the modern system, we don't have such Gurukulas. And no celibacy is possible. There is no such institution that is teaching you to maintain celibacy. In the schools and colleges, modern education is teaching you about birth control measures. You know? um, this is what is taught at least to the children in the 10th grade here in Chile. Uh, by, in biology, they are taught about the different methods of birth control and what are the pros and cons of each of these methods. So this is what is taught to the children now in schools. You know? They are not taught that you have to maintain celibacy. So Lord Chaitanya preaches according to the injunctions for Kali Yoga. And Lord Chaitanya says only Yoga Dharma is the chanting of the holy name. So anybody, anywhere, anytime, at any place can chant this holy name. Previously, this was a hidden mantra. In, and only the qualified people would get this maha mantra hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 hare hare so this mantra was not open for anyone and everyone but lord chaitanya mahaprabhu because he is the most merciful incarnation he has opened up this mantra for anyone and everyone to chant and take advantage okay so this is another reason why we are very fortunate that we have this human body in this kali yuga because this 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 mantra is open for everyone of course there are favorable conditions no so that we can i mean it's recommended to chant in the morning when your mind is fresh and but it's not a hard and fast rule because uh, lord chaitanya mahaprabhu said that there are no hard and fast rules it's not that you are going to um be committing some kind of a crime or offense if you chant late in the evening. You can chant anytime, any place, anywhere. But of course, recommended is more in the morning because that time your mind is fresh. Like how when we study for a if a student studies for the exam, morning studies the the child can be able to absorb better, study better, retain better than in the evening. Okay, but there are no hard and fast rules for the chanting of the holy name. Let's see twelve. Sarvadvarani Sayyamya Manohadini Rudhyacha Murdhyadhyatmana Pranam Asthito Yoga Dharanam Translation The yogic situation is that of detachment from all sensual engagements, closing all the doors of the senses and fixing the mind on the heart and the life air at the top of the head. One establishes himself in yoga. So what does a dhyana yogi do? He closes all the doors of the senses and fixes his mind on the heart and the life air on top of the head. And there is no question of any kind of sensual engagement for that dhyana yogi. So he has to be completely detached. See, because when you hold your consciousness between the eyebrows and you close, the, the body has nine gates. No? We have discussed how the body is called as a Navadwara Pure, the city of nine gates. The, you have the two eyes, the two ears, the two nostrils, the mouth, the anus and the genital. So what happens is wherever your consciousness is fixed at the time of death, from that hole, the soul will escape. But so what does this yogi do? He maintains his... Um, pranavayu between his forehead and then so that it can escape from the top of the head and that is uh, his success okay so this is what krishna is talking about here he closes all the doors of the senses and fixes the mind on the heart and the life air at the top of the head then one establishes himself in yoga again i repeat remember this is this krishna speaking about the dhyana yogis Translation. After being situated in this yoga practice and vibrating the sacred cell 
double O, the supreme combination of letters. If one thinks of the supreme personality of Godhead and quits his body, he will certainly reach the, the spiritual planets. So if one is uh, focusing on Om, this Eka Aksharam, one syllable, Eka Aksharam Om, the supreme combination of letters, if one thinks of the supreme personality of Godhead, if one is uh, thinking about the Lord and he's quitting his body like this, then he will certainly reach the spiritual planets. He will reach the Paramam Gatim at the time of one quitting the body, say. Uh, Tyajan Deham, when the Deha, when the body, when he's quitting the body, if he's doing this, he's thinking about the Lord and he's um, uh, vibrating this Eka Aksharam Om, then he will attain the Paramam Gatim. He can attain the spiritual planets. Now, why Om? One may say, why Om? Is Om different from Krishna? So we see from these verses, Krishna says that I am the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. In 7.8, he said this. In nine, in the ninth chapter, he will say, I am the syllable Om. And 10th chapter, he says of vibrations, I am the transcendental Om. So those who chant Om, they are also chanting the name of Krishna. So why should we chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra? Why not chant only Om? So Omkara is a mantra or maha mantra and Hare Krishna is also a maha mantra. The purpose of pronouncing Omkara is to address the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vasudev. And the purpose of chanting the Hare Krishna mantra is the same. So the purpose of chanting Omkara and the purpose of chanting the Hare Krishna maha mantra is the same. So why Om? An unusual attribute of Om is that it has no direct translation from Sanskrit to English. Is there any translation? If anybody asks you how to translate Om in English, can you give a translation? There is no translation. Therefore, every Vedantist will accept Om to be a representation of God, irrespective of whether he accepts Krishna or not. So even if the mantra is not directed to Krishna specifically, Krishna will be remembered and included in the mantra to make it effective. So this is the mercy of the Lord. See, one may... Uh, one may or may not accept Krishna, but one doesn't have a problem in chanting Om. In fact, all the mantras, they begin with Om only. So what, oh, what Krishna is doing is when we chant Om, we are chanting the name of Krishna. So even if one does not want to accept Krishna, he doesn't have a difficulty in accepting Om and he's getting the benefit of remembering Krishna by chanting Om. So Om is included in the name of Krishna. In Satya Yuga, the only mantra was Omkara. The same name Omkara is manifest in the mantra Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So if one's understanding of the absolute truth stops at Brahman effulgence, if one does not want to accept that the Lord is a person, that the Lord is a personality, he is not only a Brahman effulgence, then he chants only Om. But that also he is chanting actually the name of Krishna. But if one goes beyond and goes to the source of the Brahman, where is the Brahman effulgence coming from, then one chants the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, which is exactly what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has recommended, which is the recommendation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for Kali Yoga. So one must be a qualified Brahman to chant Om properly. These are the rules and regulations. So in the age of Kali, everyone is born a Shudra. So because this is the age of Kali, we don't have such highly qualified Brahmans. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya said, Niyamita smarane na kala. The requirements for chanting the Hare Krishna are absolutely none. So, as we said, there are no rules and regulations. Niyamita smarana na kala. There are no rules and regulations for chanting the holy name. So, this is a very nice verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 12th canto. Kaler dosha nidhe rajan astihi eko mahan guna. My dear king, although Kali Yuga is an ocean of falls, this uh, Sukadeva Goswami is telling Maharaj Parikshit because Maharaj Parikshit is concerned that, oh, this Kali Yuga is such a horrible age. How will the people of Kali Yuga be able to uplift themselves? How will they be able to realize the goal of human life? So at that time, uh, Sukadeva Goswami is telling Maharaj Parikshit that, my dear king, although this Kali Yuga is an ocean of falls, Kaler Dosha Nidhe Rajan, Ashtihi eko mahan guna. It has one good quality about this age. What is that? 
Kirtanad Eva Krishna Sya. By simply by chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, what will happen? Mukta Sangha Param Rajat. One can become free from material bondage and be promoted to the transcendental kingdom. So this is the reason why we chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra and we do not chant Om. Because according to the rules and regulations, one has to be a qualified Brahmana to chant Om properly. But for chanting this Hare Krishna Mantra, there are no hard and fast rules. Niyamita Smarana Na Kala. So one great quality, the only good quality about Kali Yuga is that just by chanting this Mahamantra, one can go back home, back to Godhead. We'll stop here. We'll continue in the next class if Krishna so sanctions. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. jai. Thank you, Mataji. Koti Koti Danvat Panam. Jai Shila Prabhupada. Jai Pataka Maharaj. Jai Krishna Mataji. Jai. Thank you, Mataji, for joining. And Hare Krishna Mataji. Chapter 8, exam. Yes. 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 Not yet, maybe next week. Okay, okay. So next week also, this will this chapter will be ending, right? No, I don't think no. so. It will take us another two sessions. Oh, we can't open the test early? We have to put it up still. Uh, Disha has to still put it up. It's not yet put up on the website. So I think by next week, we will put it up. Hare Krishna Madhavi Dandavad Parnam. Hare Krishna Madhavi Thank you. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Does anybody have a question? Hmm. No questions? Hmm. All right, then. See you all next week. I see Revati Priya Devidasi Mataji. I think you're joining us for the first time. Okay. All right, then. Have a nice week in Krishna consciousness. Thank you all for joining. Vansha Kalpa Taru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyavacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishna Vyabhyo Namo Namaha Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.